Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Sentencing Projects webinar today. My name is Jean Chung, and I'm the Communications Manager at the Sentencing Project. Um, every year, advocates and lawmakers work, to get, work together to advance policies to challenge mass incarceration and collateral consequences. Today's webinar will highlight successful efforts to scale back collateral consequences and challenge racial disparity in state sentencing policy. Our speakers today will share with us state activity in New Jersey to address racial disparities, a recent victory in Missouri authorizing a ban the box fair chance hiring policy, and a coalition effort to expand expungement for certain felony convictions in Kentucky. After the webinar, the webinar slides and a recording will be available online, and we will send the links to both of those out to all of you this week. Um, today, after the presenters have concluded, we will have a Q&A session, and you can actually submit your questions throughout the webinar as they come up using the control panel on your screen. If you look on the, the toolbar on the right, there should be a panel called Questions and you can submit your questions to us that way, um, both throughout and throughout the presentations and then during the Q&A at the end. Our first speaker will be Patty Berger, who is the Community Education Coordinator for Let's Start, Inc. Working with formerly incarcerated women and their families is her passion, and she advocates on their behalf by helping to educate the community policymakers, and other professionals about incarceration, addiction, re-entry, and the challenges faced by families impacted by these issues. Patty is a full-time student at the University of Missouri-St. Louis and will graduate with her bachelor's degree in social work later this year. She has a unique perspective on the issues faced by people who have been incarcerated. As a formerly incarcerated mother of two who spent 20 years in and out of prison and 30 years in active drug addiction, she is able to relate to the challenges faced by the people she serves. Patty, please take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Missouri, we have a, a collaboration of different nonprofits and organizations that work together for policy change. And um, one of the things we did in 2014, members of the Empower Missouri Criminal Justice Justice Task Force told us that formerly incarcerated and convicted people have few chances to be called back for an interview if they check the box submitting their criminal history on a job application. So that led us to researching some ways and uh, also some conversations with the Sentencing Project and the National Employment Law Project. We stayed persistent with this slide, please. And um, in 2015, we were able to secure a sponsor uh, in our uh, state government to get fair chance hiring passed the General Assembly. It did not go. It died, and uh, it remained unpassed with some other bills. Uh, Power Missouri convened, and the Second Chance Coalition was created. We decided to collaborate and the Sensing Project and the National Employment Law Project from New York, Missouri Catholic Conference, some nonprofits including Let's Start came together in St. Louis and formed a coalition, the Second Chance Coalition. And from that point forward, we focused on information, we focus on research, and we kept sending our governor information as it came available, such as when a President Obama uh, mentioned fair chance housing in the State of the Union address, and then 42 philanthropies, including the Deaconess Foundation, instituted fair chance housing. We sent their press releases to our governor, Governor Jay Nixon. When the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops endorsed fair chance housing, we sent that on. Myself and another formerly incarcerated man, Eric Schultz, met with the governor's staff. Both of us have um, jobs working in our community, helping other returning citizens, 
after a period of incarceration with the reentry process. So we met with the governor's staff. We shared our personal stories and the stories of the clients that we are, are now serving. When the governor of Oklahoma issued an exec executive order implementing fair chance housing, we sent that to the governor. We began connecting and collecting endorsements on fair chance housing, and we kept sending it in letters of, of support to our governor. That was a big step forward in, in, in May because we got the governor uh, to sign an executive order here in Missouri allowing to remove the ban the box uh, off of state employ, employment applications, which gives an, uh, a formerly incarcerated person or a returning citizen the opportunity to actually see the employer. Most applications that are seen get tossed in the trash if they have a check mark so that you have a felony conviction. So that opens up about 51,000 jobs to formerly incarcerated persons. We were happy about that, of course, but we quickly had to step back and keep moving forward. Um, we did have a, a sponsor. The legislation didn't go anywhere. Senator Jamila Nasheed, she uh, connected with us so that we could uh, possibly get banned the box through the hiring in the state, and it, and it worked. It didn't go anywhere in our General Assembly, though. And we keep moving forward. Although we got, got the governor to sign it, uh, here in the city of St. Louis, our mayor, Mayor Slay, he had also signed it previously. And um, we're working to hopefully at one point have it throughout the whole state of Missouri that all employers will be willing to remove that off of job applications. Thank you. Hello? Yes, great. Thank you, Patty. Um, okay. <laughs> our next presenter will be Reverend Charles Franklin Boyer who is the senior pastor of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Woodbury, New Jersey, and a racial justice advocate with a focus on criminal justice reform. Reverend Boyer has helped lead successful campaigns to have the AME Church formally recognize mass incarceration as a major priority. He led and co-authored an AME strategic response to mass incarceration titled The Covenant Project to Eradicate Mass Incarceration. He has offered testimony regarding solitary confinement at the United States Senate and the New Jersey State Senate and has been on various panels with state and federal lawmakers concerning criminal justice reform. He has been married to the love of his life, Rosalie, for 14 years, and they have three children, Shana, Kyle, and Jaden. Reverend Boyer, I'll leave it to you. Thank you for that. My favorite part uh, is, is my family. Now I'm all feeling mushy, but hopefully we can <laughs> get through this. Uh, it's definitely a, a, uh, a privilege to be here, and we are in the process uh, of some major uh, criminal justice reform regarding racial disparities here uh, in the state of New Jersey. We can move to the next slide. Um, uh, as was mentioned, I'm part of the AME Church, and so when we looked at how to build a coalition uh, surrounding uh, one of the major problems which we have here in New Jersey, uh, which is a very uh, disproportionate amount of people of color in the criminal justice system, we looked at the best ways to address this. And it was actually one of these webinars uh, that I was on uh, with the Sentencing Project uh, listening to and where they talked about racial impact statements. And so it was from there that uh, began to think about how to uh, use racial impact statements uh, to change the situation here in New Jersey. And for any of those who may not know, racial impact statements work uh, the same way as environmental or fiscal impact statements will work in that uh, any new legislation uh, brought to bear uh, any bills introduced would have to go through a litmus test in which they would have to be researched in order to see what kind of racial disparity and impact it may have. Uh, and then those bills would have to be corrected 
if they are found to uh, have a disparate uh, racial impact uh, on any particular community. So we began to, <clears throat> uh, to build the coalition and first I started at home. Uh, we're organized uh, in the New Jersey Annual Conference and we got a resolution from our conference that this would be a major legislative priority for us. And so we have over 200 churches in the state, uh, over 200,000 members, and so was able to walk uh, with that uh, authority in order to help shepherd and push this through. And we also uh, went back to the roots of this all, the sentencing project, uh, and speaking to the folks there, uh, Nicole in particular, to really help us to navigate because uh, coming in as clergy, we weren't necessarily uh, uh, have the tools in order to pull this together. And they really helped to, uh, the sentencing project really helped to give us uh, the, the mindfulness, the tools, the infrastructure, uh, and the roadmap to pull this together. And so as we built this coalition, we looked at other uh, religious organizations because we felt that we had a strong uh, moral argument to be made. So with the United Universalists, we pulled rabbis and imams. Uh, and then for even more uh, New Jersey-based um, uh, social justice organizations, we looked at the Drug Policy Alliance uh, and the ACLU, who really understood our state legislature uh, and understood what it would take uh, to get this thing. Uh, moved. And so as we were looking at possibly drafting the legislation, one of our partners, the Drug Policy Alliance, actually pointed out that several years before uh, racial impact state statement legislation had been introduced, but it really hadn't gone anywhere. Uh, and so one of the senators, Ronald Rice, was the prime sponsor. There were no other sponsors. It had no movement and it was basically dead. So we contacted him, uh, talked about uh, our thoughts and our passion behind moving this bill forward. It was reintroduced. We got behind it and worked very closely with him uh, to get some steam behind it. The next slide. So basically we worked diligently uh, to get this legislation, this bill in front of uh, every legislator and social justice organization we could find. Anywhere where uh, senators were, we were popping up and we were challenging, challenging them uh, on this. What really took place uh, at a major critical point was the Sentencing Projects uh, report, uh, which had come out recently, The Color of Justice, and when it looked at the state uh, racial disparities of who's in prison, uh, and New Jersey topped the list in the racial disparities. And so it gave so much more uh, meat to our argument. Nationally, the average is about six to one uh, of, of blacks in, uh, uh, in the prison system. But in New Jersey, it's more like 12 to one. Um, and there's various reasons for that. But at the end of the day, New Jersey touts itself as one of the states with uh, some of the best criminal justice reforms, but yet it is still one of the worst states in the nation when it comes to racial disparities. And so when we took this case to every legislator, both Republicans and Democrats, everybody recognized that, uh, that it was a major priority. And we spoke to both the Senate majority and the minority leaders uh, who both said that they were going to support it. Uh, next slide. And sure enough, they did. We, got it moved and got it pushed to a point that it did get, uh, we got it out of committee. We had a, a great um, support of, of clergy and social justice leaders to help testify, to get behind it. Um, uh, there, there, was, there was a lot, a lot of support behind it. And when it came to a full, um, to the full Senate, it passed with total bipartisan support. 36 to 0, which floored us because New Jersey is extremely polarized in its politics. Well, I guess that's everywhere in the country, but extremely polarized in its politics. And to have total bipartisan support uh, in the Senate was, was, uh, was a big success for us. Uh, next slide. So, so now um, it's 
it's time for us to try and push this through the assembly and we're working with the sponsor in the assembly we've sat down uh, with him we're currently going through the same process that we went through in the Senate working to bring other sponsors to the table uh, we're calling uh, all of the different members of the public uh, public law safety committee working diligently to have all of their constituents reach out to them so we're in, again in a, in a very critical time and given the uh, emphasis on criminal justice reform in the country we're really trying to seize this moment we believe that timing is everything and for us to be able to make this moral argument and also now being able to take the fact that this passed the Senate with full bipartisan support we're getting a lot of interest from the assembly members because uh, it, it, it shows that this is not uh, really a divisive uh, issue so we're working built very diligently there and the prime sponsor one of his main uh, interest uh, or the, the sponsor in the in the assembly his main interest uh, and passion behind it now is the fact that it got this level of support uh, out of the Senate and so he's feeling good that uh, he may be a major part uh, of this legislation next slide And so that's basically uh, that's basically it. Again, timing uh, timing is everything. And once we finish uh, uh, with the assembly, and we believe we're going to have success there, and we're looking to get it on the governor's desk and to bring uh, pressure to bear to get it signed there, and hoping if we get the same bipartisan support out of out of the assembly as we have out of the Senate, uh, that we'll get success from the governor as well. And even if we don't. We believe we have a strong enough case, uh, given that we're about to have gubernatorial elections coming up next year, that we'll be able to make it a major priority uh, for those candidates. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Reverend. Um, our next speaker is Ed Moynihan, who began his career as a public defender in 1976. He was appointed Kentucky P Public Advocate by the governor in 2008 and reappointed to a second term in 2012. He's a member of the American Council of Chief Defenders and a member of its executive committee. The ACCD is a section of the National Legal Aid and Defender Association comprised of chief defenders from across the nation dedicated to securing a fair justice system and ensure ensuring high quality legal representation for poor people who face loss of life, freedom, or family. Ed is also a member of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and co-chairs its Committee on Pretrial Release Advocacy. Ed, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. And um, I want to begin by talking about a coalition that we have here in Kentucky that formed a year and a half or two years ago. Uh, and you can see from the slide that it has, it's a group of uh, significant organizations in Kentucky, American Civil Liberties Union, the Catholic Conference, Council of Churches, the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, Kentucky Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, Kentucky Youth Advocates, the Bluegrass Institute, which is a conservative think tank, and the Center for Economic Policy, which is a progressive think tank. So this is a, a group of organizations that have a presence in the legislature each year, but uh, on most issues, uh, one or more of the members is at odds with the other on uh, particular policy issues. So it's quite unique coalition because uh, when they speak to an issue, uh, attention is brought to it because uh, peop the legislators uh, view this as an unusual group of people working together. As they formed, the first uh, policy issue that they addressed was to work on a Class D felony expungement piece of legislation that had been uh, introduced and had passed the House uh, in many previous years but had never been called up in the Senate. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about that. But on the next slide you can see 
that this year we had another major development in Kentucky with uh, the governor establishing this policy assessment council, a broad group of people that are uh, working for uh, broader criminal justice reform in Kentucky as uh, we try to address uh, more smarter outcomes in the criminal justice system. They've broken out into reentry, recidivism, probation and parole, drug policy, jail reform, subcommittees. So that's another good movement here in Kentucky. On the next slide, though, you can see a little bit more about the expungement bill. Uh, it had been uh, worked by a group of uh, people for many years without uh, it being enacted into law. It, uh, for the first time, allows for Class D felonies, which some Class D felonies, which are the lowest felony in Kentucky it's with a one to five year sentence, uh, can, can be eligible for expungement. But the other significant thing it did is it broadened the ability to have misdemeanors expunged. And talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. You can see this is the broad coalition of people. Uh, it's a remarkable group of people. Um, Representative Owens, standing next to the governor, has uh, the, the Smart on Crime Coalition members. It had the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, the uh, Chamber of Commerce out of Louisville and Lexington actively supporting this. They saw this Class D felony expungement law as uh, a workforce issue. In Kentucky, they wanted uh, to increase the number of people that businesses could hire. hire. Uh, the the uh, bill that was passed has a provision in it that allows for immunity uh, if an employer is civilly sued, which was important to the business community and had the support of leadership in, uh, the, uh, in the Senate and uh, the Senate uh, chair, Senator Westerfield. So. Uh, the picture kind of demonstrates the broad uh, bipartisan nature of, of this uh, bill that finally passed. The next slide shows the two major changes. It now says there's no limit to the number of misdemeanors that can be expunged. That's a huge improvement. Um, felonies can no longer block a misdemeanor from being expunged and for misdemeanors there's no five-year look-back period. On the felony changes, uh, it, uh, the, the original bill said that uh, a felon, Class D felony would be expunged five years after a completion of a sentence, but that got changed to uh, a motion to vacate certain felonies, uh, not all Class D felonies. Um, but the good thing about the motion to vacate, it's a procedure that, that literally, legally, in all other ways, wipes the felony off the books. Um, and if you have a felony that's not eligible to be expunged, that does not block the expungement of the misdemeanor or an eligible Class D felony. So and as the next slide shows, uh, about 70% of the Class D felonies, so not 100%, but about 70%, you can see the ones, uh, the ma major Class D felonies that are uh, able to be expunged on that slide. The next slide describes the expungement process. There's a $40 fee to get the process started that's non-refundable. Uh, unfortunately, it can take a little bit of time to get a return on that uh, request for the certification that the felony or the misdemeanor qualifies. Um, the Kentucky State Police make a determination in their opinion of whether or not under the law the, the particular offense qualifies for uh, expungement. Next slide. Uh, you know that that last line there that was added uh, shows that um, you know in Kentucky, if 
Kentucky State Police indicate they don't believe it qualifies, that doesn't mean it's over with. Sometimes records are not accurate, so we encourage people in Kentucky to uh, <clears throat> be knowledgeable about the law and, if necessary, talk with a lawyer. On the next slide, we're looking at some future changes. We have a $500 fee for a felony. It's 100 for misdemeanor. Uh, the 500 is pretty steep, and it's one of the highest in the nation. Uh, fortunately, the law does not preclude the fee from being waived if you can demonstrate indigency, uh, but that's a pretty steep fee for a lot of people, especially if they have to also engage a lawyer to help them maneuver through the minutia of the law. So possible future changes include lowering the uh, fee, uh, making them explicitly waivable, expand the list of felonies beyond the 70% in the Class D felony range, uh, eliminate the certification and $40 fee if you're acquitted, and to clarify some of the provisions that uh, there's going to be differences of opinion on exactly what is a single incident, uh, the length of the enhancement period, and some of the fees in the misdemeanor cases. So we're very hopeful uh, that as this law is put into effect and people see it as helping people, giving them a second chance, allowing them to uh, come out from under the economic death sentence they're under, become contributing members of their community, and reward people for uh, a good, good behavior for a period of time that uh, legislators would become increasingly comfortable with expanding this to uh, the f uh, more Class D felony expenses, uh, offenses. Great. Thank you, Ed. Um, and our final speaker will be Nicole Porter, who is the Director of Advocacy at the Sentencing Project. Nicole manages the Sentencing Project's state and local advocacy efforts on sentencing reform, voting rights, and eliminating racial disparities in the criminal justice system. Her advocacy has supported criminal justice reforms in several states, including Kentucky, Missouri, and California. Nicole was named a new civil rights leader by Essence Magazine in November 2014 for her work to eliminate mass incarceration. Since joining the Sentencing Project in 2009, Nicole's work has been cited in several major media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and National Public Radio. She has given a number of talks on state sentencing policy, collateral consequences, and racial disparity to various audiences, including the League of Women Voters, the NAACP, and the United Methodist Women's Assembly. Nicole, take it away. Thank you, Jean. And thank you everyone else for joining us this afternoon. I just wanted to offer a few highlights from other state campaigns, um, work being anchored by organizers and policy advocates um, who are strategizing to challenge mass incarceration and address racial disparity. As we all know, scaling back the rate of incarceration and addressing the collateral consequences associated with the conviction really requires a 50-state solution of meaningful efforts that include formerly incarcerated persons like Patty, elected officials, policy advocates, faith leaders like Reverend Boyer, and grassroots organizers and other practitioners and leaders um, like Mr. Moynihan, who have joined us this afternoon. I just wanted to highlight other activity and um, that we are aware of, and perhaps in the Q&A, there will be an opportunity to hear what other states are doing from the audience members who've joined us today. On sentencing reform, including revisiting mandatory minimum policies and other known drivers of mass incarceration like habitual offender laws, there's a range of activity among states so far in 2016. Earlier this year, we convened a webinar where we heard from a colleague, Drury Finnell, with the Delaware Governor's Office about legislation that would address that state's three strikes law. The governor recently signed the law um, reform in July, and that reform specifically eliminates mandatory life sentences for persons convicted of drug offenses and provides judges with more discretion for sentencing nonviolent offenses. In Minnesota, a coalition of criminal justice reformers, 
defense attorneys, prosecutors, and law enforcement officials came together in support of a drug reform measure that has recalibrated lengthy prison terms for certain drug offenses, including provisions to raise the minimum weight to qualify for serious charges for prison-bound defendants for certain drug offenses, including meth and, co and cocaine. For example, a first-degree sale would be redefined as 17 grams up from the current 10 grams in Minnesota. And this reform is a step in the right direction, but was a compromise given the political support needed to move the legislation through the process and was more modest in comparison to a drug reform plan recommended by that state's um, Sentencing Guidelines Commission. That, state, that plan would have overhauled the state's drug sentencing guidelines and reduced recommended prison sentences for persons with first-time drug offenses convicted of first-degree drug possession and sentences for first-degree drug sales. Other sentencing reforms this year have been advanced in Florida, Michigan, and Iowa. There have also been efforts to challenge um, racial disparity in the criminal justice system in addition to what we learned about in New Jersey. In states like Maryland and Washington, um, there have been efforts uh, building on momentum to challenge racial disparity. Lawmakers in Maryland and Washington have championed the racial impact statement, a legislation similar to what um, Reverend Boyer's coalition is working on in New Jersey. And state advocates where legislation wasn't introduced have worked to challenge racial disparity as well. In recent months, advocates in Oklahoma and South Carolina have placed commentary raising concerns about the impact of justice policies on communities of color. And there have been additional reforms regarding collateral consequences. As we heard, it remains so important to address the barriers that can impact the justice involved persons long after their criminal sentence has been completed. As many of you know, collateral consequences range from a loss of voting rights to automatic bans on housing. Um, with regards to voting rights, given that we are in a current electoral season, it's important to highlight recent reforms in expanding the franchise to persons with felony convictions. Recently, California's governor signed legislation granting voting rights to people convicted of felonies who are being held in county-run jails. Earlier this year, a Maryland grassroots coalition anchored an effort to automatically restore voting rights to persons living in the community under supervision. About 40,000 individuals have their voting rights restored and are eligible to vote in this um, coming election. And as many of you may have heard, Virginia's governor issued an executive order. Um, despite ongoing litigation from the legislature, that executive order restored voting rights to tens of thousands of persons with felony conviction. And just last week in Alabama, citizens who are disenfranchised due to a felony conviction filed a federal lawsuit challenging that state's disenfranchisement statute. And we heard about um, Missouri's fair chance hiring reform earlier this year and the fact that they um, uh, were able to move, build momentum on that reform based on activity in Oklahoma. Well, in Oklahoma, the public and governor issued an executive order establishing a fair chance hiring policy similar to what we heard um, happened in, in Missouri. So this is an overview and by no means provides a comprehensive list of all the activity that's taken uh, place in 2016. I invite callers to get in touch with us to share their stories of advocacy and their stories of success to challenge mass incarceration and eliminate collateral consequences. And with that, I'll turn the call back over to Jean and look forward to learning from our audience about other activity that's happening around the country. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, we now have about 25 minutes for Q&A, and we have a few questions that have been already submitted through the GoToWebinar panel. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to submit, again, you can do that through the GoToWebinar control panel. It's the toolbar that's probably on the right hand of your screen, and there should be a section called Questions, um, where you can type in your question and submit it that way. Um, I'll, we'll start with a couple questions for Reverend Boyer um, about the bill in New Jersey that he discussed. So the question has two parts. First, it says, does this legislation require all pieces of legislation 
to pass racial impact reviews, or just laws relating to criminal justice? If all, how did the team work with groups working on different advocacy issues, environmental, housing, and education, that, have, that often have disparate racial impacts? Um, and then this person also asks if it would be possible to see a copy of the language of the New Jersey bill. Okay, um, I'm glad you asked this. This is a great question. Um, yes, absolutely, uh, you can see copies, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that we can submit that to the sentencing project and they can uh, push it out to everybody. Uh, I do caution that the language that's in the bill currently, we're working on trying to get some amendments uh, uh, in there as far as the way the process goes so we can make sure that it's it's uh, it's airtight. Also, we're trying to include the juvenile justice system uh, in there. So we're currently working through that process. So when we submit it, um, I guess my, my suggestion is that we'll also uh, uh, include the, the memo on the amendments that we're trying to work on to make the bill stronger. Uh, as of right now, the reason why I think this is a great question uh, is that our long-term goal uh, is to have racial impact statements across sectors. That would be far too of a heavy lift right now because uh, when we get into education and we get into housing, then we're working with multiple different committees. And my suggestion for anybody would be, if you're going to work on racial impact, uh, would be one, to start with criminal justice because there's momentum behind criminal justice reform right now. And once that's there, it sets up a template and you already have a strong coalition uh, and, and some history to go and tackle each place one by one. So one of uh, our partners that we're working with, the Anti-Poverty Network, this is a major, um, a major priority for them as well. And so once we get criminal justice reform, we'll be working with them in things like poverty, housing, et cetera, et cetera. Great. Um, and we also had a question about that New Jersey bill, about what the bill number was. Um, the Senate version is Senate Bill 677 in New Jersey, and the Assembly Bill is Assembly Bill number 3677. Um, next, we'll go to a question for Ed, um, which is, I'm unclear how the Kentucky PD are allowed to determine what crimes qualify for expungement. Would you mind clarifying? And uh, Ed, you may have to unmute yourself on your phone. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Thank Great. you. Um, good question. I assume the question means how is the Kentucky State Police able to determine what? Uh, so in Kentucky, the statute is KRS 431.073, 431.073. So the Kentucky State Police have to issue a certificate that the that, that on the for the felony that it qualifies. So they look at the statute and they see whether or not the crime is one that has been identified in the statute by its statutory number as qualifying. The second thing they have to do, it the, the expungement law says that you can get a felony that qualifies expunged or Felonies, plural, if it if they arise at, from a single incident. So that's a judgment call for which different people can agree or not. The state police may have one viewpoint. The client may have a different viewpoint. Uh, the other things the state police look at are whether or not the person has previously had a felony conviction vacated. If they have, they're not eligible. Uh, they look at whether there's a pending fel new felony in addition to the one being expunged. If those two things would be the case, or one of those, the felony would not be eligible to be expunged. So there's some judgment by the state police after a search of the information of whether or not they will certify that the felony qualifies under the law. And, you know, there's, arising from a single incident, different people are going to have a different point of view, and we've already had some litigation starting over uh, what that means. Great. Um, next we have a question which I think is for Nicole. Uh, the question is, 
Indiana needs some support, and I would like to be part of the process to reform the Indiana criminal justice system. How do I get started gaining support from the organization from Indiana? Um, not sure if that means the sentencing project. Um, well, I'm happy to talk with you, um, whoever submitted that question offline. But for anyone on the call who's interested in um, developing a campaign or organizing a campaign, um, I would suggest uh, you know doing an analysis and developing um, an understanding of what's already happening in your state. And um, in some ways, I can uh, provide some uh, assistance in initial um, um, in initial research in terms of understanding what's happened recently, um, state by state, and also connecting with organizers and policy advocates who are engaged in criminal justice reform and uh, discussing what your capacity may or may not be to organize a campaign. So hopefully this call, this webinar has provided you with some ideas. Indiana is a state that has expanded its expungement policy in recent years. There is a fair chance hiring policy in the state of Indiana. And they've also, that state has also reformed um, sentencing uh, policies in recent years, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done, as is true in all states, even states viewed as more progressive. Um, and so we continue to look for opportunities to work with all of you, and whoever submitted that question, please get in touch with me um, after the webinar, and I'd be happy to talk more with you about uh, possible next steps in Indiana. Thanks, Nicole. Um, now we have a question for Reverend Boyer regarding the AME Ministers Coalition for Redemption and Justice. And the question is, I see the word redemption used a lot by those seeking to improve the fate of folks with convictions. But if one can only be redeemed once one has sinned, doesn't the language of redemption risk reinforcing the notion that convictions are about sin when they are more often the product of poverty, racism, pressure to plead guilty, and or inadequately resourced defense counsel? <laughs> so, uh, great question. I wasn't expecting the theological questions. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let, me, let, let me just say, um, to try and make the answer as simple and short as possible, that, um, that all of what was said was very true. But I think the day we see racism as done is a day when people of color can sin and not face the consequences the same way white folks can. And so uh, when we're talking about redemption, and it, it doesn't necessarily, a lot of the people in the, it doesn't mean that they didn't do anything wrong. And I think as on the personal side of things, we have to deal with that uh, issue as well. But the difference is, is that in other neighborhoods, folks can do things wrong, but they're not challenged and they don't, their whole lives aren't destroyed uh, as a repercussion of it. So this particular use of language obviously is a Christian term, which is all based in redemption, that we all can be redeemed and that all of us fall short. And therefore, regardless of what we've done, um, we're seeing that uh, redemptive justice is the way the criminal, uh, criminal justice system should be done. That's our goal rather than punitive justice. And so our, our goal is to move forward to a redemption model where the people have done, done wrong or not rather than a punitive model. Wow. Whew. Thank you, Reverend Boyer. Um, I think Patty uh, had some comments to add yes. to what Ed was saying earlier. Yes, Ed was talking about expungement. We got some legislation passed uh, this past May also in Missouri. It started out um, really bulky, but it ended up part of, bipartisan and there was some agreement on some things. It's far from what we would like to see. At this point, it's for one felony, two misdemeanors, and the Ferguson Commission report uncovered 
all the arrests in the municipalities uh, in Missouri and people missing court because they can't pay the fine and getting rearrested and it going on sometimes for years. And this was part of that uh, legislation on expungement that any amount of, of municipal charges or arrests or even you know people who have pled guilty could be expunged also. And uh, the fee went from five hundred down to a hundred dollars. And like I said, there was a lot of people interested in this bill. I was uh, one of the people that testified at the. Uh, hearing on it but it um, it's it's a step in the right direction and of course you never get everything that you want but I just wanted to comment on that thank you this is Ed in Kentucky I, I wanted to add to two, two simple thoughts one we have up on our Kentucky Department of Public Advocacy webpage that's at dpa.ky.gov uh, a bunch of information for folks trying to understand the Kentucky law with a link to a clean slate link uh, if anybody wants to know more about the Kentucky information. The other thing I wanted to briefly say is as this process has occurred over the last several years, uh, Kentucky has consulted with the sentencing project, in particular Nicole Porter, to help us understand what was going on nationally with felony expungement and Sentencing Project has provided uh, an incredible uh, assist in us presenting high quality information to let the legislators in Kentucky and coalition members know where Kentucky stands uh, as compared to nationally. Thank you, Ed. Um, here's another question um, that I think any anyone could take. Um, it says, we passed fair chance hiring for private employers in Austin in March. We also know that we are getting ready for a huge battle at the legislature and the broader framing of preemption. Texas won a similar override of local jurisdictions in relation to fracking. What are some strategies we can employ to beat preemption? This is Nicole. I think that what Texas is about to go through and if I'm understanding the question correctly and what I know about um, what the advocates and the organizers are about to experience in Texas is that there will be state policy introduced that will prevent local jurisdictions from um, enacting their own fair chance hiring or ban the box policies, particularly given that there's resistance from private employers from requiring um, ban the box and um, uh, private employment applications. Or eliminating the box on private employment applications. And so I think given that there was a successful effort in, in Texas to prevent that um, for fracking for another area of social policy reform, that probably the best lessons learned are there. Um, and the political strategies that organizers were able to put in place and the tactics that organizers were able to leverage um, are probably going to be the most instructive in terms of uh, trying to prevent state policy from preventing um, local jurisdictions from enacting fair chance hiring policies. I think, um, you know, as you all have this conversation in Texas, be mindful of the fact that there are other states that have expanded fair chance hiring to private employers, and it may be an opportunity in the defense to protect what happened in Austin or Travis County. Um, to protect that uh, private employer fair chance hiring policy, to know that other states have adopted uh, pri uh, expanded fair chance to private employers statewide, including states like Minnesota. Um, and this conversation is happening nationally. So while what uh, President Obama has done in D.C. may not go over that well in the Texas uh, legislature, there are private businesses that have come out in support the fair chance hiring and have enacted their own uh, fair chance hiring policies without any requirement from government. And so the uh, resistant um, individuals or, or organizations in Texas should know that the Coke industry is a supportive of fair chance hiring, that Walmart is supportive of fair chance hiring. And so there are conservative led organizations and corporate entities who um, are champions of this policy. And it's hopeful 
that the National Conversation aligned with what you all have already learned around the political strategies to prevent um, preemption um, can help protect the fair chance hiring in Austin and, and be um, instructive for um, other efforts in other states and in other jurisdictions around the country as well. Great. Um, we have another question for Ed, which is what steps uh, is Kentucky taking to have these res resources to juveniles that have come in contact with the juvenile justice system? And how soon does a juvenile have to wait until he or she can get their record expunged? Um, since often youth are ineligible to have their records expunged until many years after their cases have been closed. And repeat the first sentence again. Um, what steps um, is Kentucky taking to have these resources to juveniles? Uh, that's a good question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So in 2014, we had major juvenile reform in Kentucky, Senate Bill 200. Its primary purpose was to keep kids out of the criminal justice system on the belief that many of the kids coming into the system were in need of social services and not a criminal justice response. It's had great success at keeping more kids out of the system uh, through what we call a FAIR team, which involves the social service agencies, public defender, county attorney, uh, some court personnel, looking at the kid before they, it has to go through the FAIR team before it can come into the criminal justice system. That's where the response is increasingly a social service response as opposed to a forwarding it on to the criminal justice system. And it's reduced the number of kids detained dramatically. It's reduced the number of status offenses that have uh, been coming into the court system. And the good thing the legislature did in Kentucky was create a juvenile justice oversight council chaired by the two judiciary chairs. It meets monthly to review the implementation of this bill. So it's had high success at making dramatic progress in Kentucky. Uh, the, uh, the felony, the expungement for juveniles is uh, a little bit more favorable than what we have for uh, adults in terms of uh, length of time and uh, the process. So uh, that's, uh, that's where we are in Kentucky on juvenile uh, matters. Great, thank you, Ed. Um, here's a quick question for Nicole. Can Nicole explain briefly the reforms that have happened in Florida over the last year? Um, over the last year, there were efforts to address mandatory minimums in Florida. I can provide more specifics um, um, offline about that. I don't have the details in front of me. Okay, great. This is Ed. I, this is Ed. I wonder if I might mention some other progress in Kentucky if we have time. Um, sure. Why don't I'll just uh, go to one last question and then we can give each of the presenters um, some time to close with anything that they'd like to. Um, so the last question um, is for Reverend Boyer, and it says Oregon has passed and celebrated a racial impact statement bill um, in 2014. And through a number of compromises, it has been so far rendered almost useless. Um, are you facing similar demands for compromise? For example, um, in Oregon, there is an amendment that needs to be removed that requires a bipartisan, so one Democrat, one Republican, referral for a racial impact statement to be completed by the responsible agency. Well, right now, we, we as of right now, um, we've gotten through the Senate, and we're, this month, we're waiting for it to be uh, brought up in committee uh, in, in the Assembly. And through the Senate, we did not get uh, really almost in, any pushback. Um, and now the Assembly may be a different matter, particularly because I know some of the the folks on the assembly like to challenge things a little bit more.
but uh, but as of right now, we're not really at that stage. There hasn't been uh, uh, any proposed amendments from other forces. It's really only only us right now that are uh, working to strengthen the bill. So that remains to be seen. Uh, but I'm glad that you brought that up because that will uh, help me to be a little more uh, uh, mindful of, of of what has happened uh, in other states. So I can try to. Uh, protect against it here. Okay, great. Um, I apologize if we didn't get to your question um, on the sli on the slides. That's this on the slide that's up now. You should see the contact information for all of the presenters. So please feel free to reach out with any remaining questions. Um, and at this point, I'd like to give each of the presenters um, some time to close with anything they'd like to say. Um, so maybe we'll start with Patty and then go in the order that we presented. Hi, um, I would like to uh, make a comment um, that as a formerly incarcerated woman and um, the unintended consequences that come with incarceration, not just for me, but for my family and my community, it's an uphill battle um, with the conviction always being there. No matter what I do, it's always there. And in Missouri, I spoke on expungement. I'm not, I don't qualify because I have more than one felony conviction. So I think if we all keep working towards this, and um, people uh, who've been convicted and people who have been incarcerated have a voice, like you've given me today. Uh, I think that we can come to a place where we can make some changes that are meaningful for everybody. And uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to present today. Um, I, I would just like to um, to offer myself with, uh, it, it's funny, when I'm on the line with the coalition uh, members, I say that uh, all all of them have far more experience in, in this legislative and reform world uh, than I do. I'm just a preacher trying to do what I believe God has called me to do. And um, I, I have a firm belief that clergy, in particular African American clergy, uh, needs to be involved in the racial justice issues and racial justice policy uh, implementation and reforms. Uh, all across this country. And from a theological aspect, I come from the viewpoint that those who are oppressed have to be the ones involved in their own liberation. And so being passionate about that, anybody who is working on these issues, regardless of who you are, uh, across the country and is particularly interested in working on racial uh, impact uh, in, in your area and would just I uh, think you could benefit from the experience that we've uh, that we've had, and also that we're going to have. I just offer myself up as a resource uh, to talk to uh, and and to um, to tell you what strategies work uh, and have worked so far for us. Thank you. This is Ed in Kentucky. To, to, we had some good progress last year through the Kentucky Smart on Crime Coalition support of a bill that would have established a gross misdemeanor, reducing felonies down to gross misdemeanor, create automatic parole for a certain class of nonviolent uh, felony offenders, uh, modify the mandatory persistent felony offender law to discretionary, uh, to allow communities to have a, to have a say, and create some graduated sanctions for technical violations to pass the House 65 to 30. So we're very hopeful this year. We also have a robust Department of Public Advocacy alternative sentencing social worker program that where we're producing uh, alternative sentences that are community-based for people with mental illness, juveniles, and people with substance abuse. And the coalitions in Kentucky are making a huge difference. Coalitions. I find are hard from the word go, but they're essential to make progress in this complex uh, political environment. And I, I'm just impressed with the growing number of people interested in common sense reform. Well, 
Well, this is Nicole at the Sentencing Project. Um, I want to thank all of our presenters and Jean for um, contributing to this webinar and for all of the um, participants for calling in this afternoon. And I want to in invite you all to be in touch with us um, as you consider what you've heard um, during this webinar and um, what you may be thinking might be possible in your state around reforming um, criminal justice system or addressing collateral consequences, we're here to help and we're here um, to provide uh, assistance and to talk through what possible strategies and tactics may be. So we do hope that this webinar has been helpful um, and we hope uh, to continue to be in dialogue with all of you around opportunities uh, to change the system. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. I just want to echo, um, thank you everyone for participating today and especially our presenters. Um, again, the webinar slides and a recording of the webinar will be available online and we will send you information on how to access those things um, along with the language from the racial impact statement bill from Reverend Boyer. Um, so thank you again.